But what do you want to know? What all you want to know? Come on. No. Uh, how'd you get the name Meatloaf? Huh? I don't know. Anyway, I get that. I've been, I've been asked that question forever. Look, I'm going to tell you. Four days old, born nine and a half pounds, bright red. My dad was a redneck Dallas policeman. And I do stand-up comedy from time to time. I don't know if this actually happened, but this is part of my... To my son, looks like nine and a half pounds of ground chuck. So I want you nurses to get one of them cardboard signs that goes in the front of them plastic cribs and on that little cardboard piece, you're going to write the name Meat. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I'm a Dallas policeman, and you have to do exactly what I tell you to do. Because if you don't, you know what's going to happen to you. A Dallas policeman's going to take you in. So they did. And then he said, I want you to move that crib right up to the front of that window there in that nursery so that everybody comes up to see their babies, they see meat. And uh, I don't know if that actually happened. I, I was there, but who knows? And so the loaf, you want to know about the loaf? I stepped on a coach's foot in the eighth grade. He screamed, get off my foot, you hunk a mean loaf. The next day I go in the locker room. The teammates have put up a sign on the locker. And it says, meat, space, loaf. They gave me a first name. And because I, and the reason is, I'd been called meat from the time I was four days old. Not everybody, it was off and on, sporadically. Meat, I had a third grade teacher that liked calling me meat. Meat, you know, meat. So they knew meat. So they they knew meat, and they added the loaf. So it became two words, meat, loaf. And also, it wasn't the food. Food's one word. I'm two words. And now, everybody, I'm telling you, everybody calls me meat. I've got doctors that call me. I'm going, meat, how you doing? And some of the, some of the nurses, you know, they love, uh, hi, you know. And they get nervous, and I look at them, I say, look, you got to understand, just think of me in the Stu, Chuck, and Frank family. Me, Chuck, Frank, and Stu. And they go, oh, yeah. You might remember this guy. Played baseball for the Los Angeles Angels. His name was Chili Davis. Okay, I'm at an Alice Cooper celebrity golf event where they, you play with other people and we, you know, and uh, they pay money to be, so anyway. But the day before, Chili says to me, me, see, me, you want to go out and play a practice round? I said, yeah. So we went out and I'm on the fourth hole, I'm keeping score and uh, I hadn't paid any attention to it. So I yell out, Chili, what'd you get? Oh, Chili got a three. Okay, Stu, what'd you get? Three. Frank, what'd you get? Four. And meat got a five. And so it was chili, stew, frank, and meat. Come on. That's it. So I would say I'm like the stew, chuck, and frank family. I took out chili and put in chuck because chili's not an ordinary name, but chuck is. And so stew and so is frank. So there you go. doing the Storytellers Tour, which we loved that tour, and people loved that tour. And VH1, we were the only act that they let go out on the road and do Storytellers, because I really knew how to do it. Let me tell you a little story about Storytellers. I went to record my, my Storytellers um, for VH1. So the director walks up to me and goes, okay, what's your set list? I go, what? What do you mean, what's my set list? Yeah. What's your set list? All the other bands, and I first before they said that, I said, I'm not psychic. I don't know. Uh, I said, uh, and he goes, well, all the other bands have given me a set list. I said, well, all the other bands didn't do storytellers because the object of storytellers was this. The audience asks you a question, and you play a song based on that question. So how am I supposed to give you a set list? And then the head of BH1 walked in at the time and goes, what, what's happening? And, and the director goes, he won't give me a set list. And I go, it's not supposed to be. And he goes, no, Meatloaf can do this. Meatloaf can handle this. I don't care what other people have done. You let Meatloaf run. And he did. The only thing they did was 
at three hours and 15 minutes of this show, they came to me and said, because uh, it's Saturday night, they, they got, we're running out of tape, and we got another five minutes and then only 10 minutes left, so you got to do the last five minutes and then because we had said we were going to play Battle of Hell at the end. They, we told them we would play the beginning of the end of All Wrapped Up to start and Battle of Hell would be our closing song. And if any question happened about Battle of Hell, I'd say it later. And so five minutes and so I went back to the person who asked about Battle of Hell. I said, okay, now it's time for your question. And we played Battle of Hell and that was it. So they ran out of tape. So I'm going to tell you a little story about two out of three ain't bad. Now, I know everybody thinks Sven Golly, Jim Steinman. Now, Jim Steinman is a genius and remarkable and really has a way with words. I mean, I've written songs. I had a number one hit in the UK and a top ten hit here with John Parr that I co-wrote with him. So I can write. And uh, he, it wasn't all him on Bad Out of Hell, trust me. Todd Rundgren had a lot to do with it. I had a lot to do with it. Let's take, for example, Bad Out of Hell. He played me the song. Uh, let me change a couple of things. But he played me the song up to the second chorus of Bad Out of Hell. I said, okay, where's the rest of the story? He said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you got this guy and this girl to this point. You got to finish the story. And so he comes back. And the next part, I can see myself tearing up the road faster than any other boy has ever gone. And I guess to the point, never see this side on curve till it's way too late. And then I said, let's repeat that. So we repeated that. And then we sang the next part. I said, okay, let's uh, repent. Re uh, so it's my part. The song is almost 11 minutes on my fault. And so I repeated that. I said, okay, now when I repeat it, I'm going to shoot it up the octave because it was down here. Uh, I can't remember the words now, but I shot it up the octave, we finished, and I said, let's go up high on Bad Out of Hell. I ended on three high C's, and I said, I'm ending up high, and he said, that's a C, you okay? I said, yeah, of course, and I was then. I I can still hit it now, but not like that. I'm, I'm good for a B, B flat I can nail. C, a little tough. I used to be able to hit D. Whoa, okay, so I'm gonna tell you another little story. Now, two out of three was written, okay? And Todd Rundgren rearranged it. Todd Rundgren and I, Jimmy was sick, and we rearranged all revved up with no place to go. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, we got to make this song because all that southern Georgia stuff was really in. I said, we can't do that, but we got to make it close to that. And so we changed that. Jim Steinman, he was sick that day. He freaked out when we cut that track. He goes, hang on, you can't do that. And Todd goes, yeah, it's great. And so that's what it is. Jim likes it now, but at the time he didn't. But I, I, I flipped it around on him a little bit. But on two out of three ain't bad. He had the song done, and Todd rearranged some of it, but pretty much Jim nailed it, except for the first line, and he couldn't get the first line. And so Ty goes, we got to record this vocal today. I said, okay. So he started the tape. Now remember, we didn't have the first line. He started the tape, and I did a lot of improv. I worked with Belushi. I worked with Gilda. I replaced John in a show. It was an all improv show. So I studied improv. I know how to do improv. The idea is you can never say no. You just have to keep, keep, as they say, playing it forward. So you understand playing it forward, and that's improv. No matter what they say to you, so is the, is you want the jello? Uh, do you like this jello? You don't say, no, I don't like this jello. You go, well, do they have boxes that come in that color? Which totally skews it, okay? And then you can be funny. That would be funny if we were doing an improv. They have boxes in that color, which has nothing to do with jello. So now, I'm going back to the story. Sorry, I go off on tangents. So I sang this, we were, he started the tape, and out of my mouth, we, I waited for the intro and it came, baby we can talk all night, 
but that ain't getting us nowhere. And I kept going. And I stopped down a little bit. And Doug goes, did you just sing the first line? I said, I don't know, did I? Because I get in the character, I'm lost. We played it back. We liked the first line, I sang it over because it could be better. And uh, so I wrote the first long, first, I guess that's two lines, first two lines on two out of three ain't bad. So there. Yes, Jim Steinman is an absolute genius, but Paradise by the Dashboard Light is my story. The beginning is all my story, and I sit with the car, and we went through it and about uh, dating a girl um, named, what was her name? Oh, Renee. Renee, see? And um, so Renee, uh, his father later became mayor of Dallas, uh, she had, well, large boobs, okay? And so... I told Jimmy the story of me and Renee parking out by the lake over and over and over again. And I told him the whole, I had a, I had a convertible, a Ford convertible with an amazing dashboard. I start, that's the story. That's where the dashboard light came from. So I told him the story and I said, but every night we'd get to, you know where, and she'd go, no, stop right there. Stop, stop right there. So that's where the line stop right there came from. And that's paradise. Yes, <laughs> and Art Shamsky did book Bill Rizzuto. And Art Shamsky came in because we had asked for Bill Rizzuto. We wanted him to do the play-by-play. -play. And Art came in and we kind of made the deal with Art. And then he goes, but Phil wants to talk to you. And so Phil came in and we talked to Phil and he goes, well, um, do you have to take drugs to do to hear this song? And Jim looked at him and said, Bill, it's probably better if you don't do drugs when you listen to this song. <laughs> Phil kind of looked at him funny. Jim was, Jim was serious. And I, I just laughed. And, and so uh, Phil agreed to do the song. So we get to the day. Uh, we wanted Phil to do what he does. There, holy cow, look, you know, be excited. And so Phil starts reading like this. There it is, a line shot up the middle. Look at him go. He's rounding first and heading to... And so, <laughs> uh, Todd's going, what is... Todd, Todd, who had no patience at all. What's he doing out there? Okay, we don't have time for this. And Jim goes, Todd, stop it. We all both did. We all just hit Todd upside the head. Stop it. And so we go, Phil, uh, like you do in a game time. Or Jim did. Jim, like... Uh, Todd, uh, Phil, like you do in game. Oh, I got it. Okay. There it is. A line shot up the middle. Look at him go. He's rounding first and heading for second. He, you know, a little more expression. So Todd was getting really perturbed. We, stop it, Todd. So I decided this. Now, you got to figure, I weigh 280 pounds, okay? I don't weigh that now. I only weighed 212 this morning. So anyway, that's still big. I want to weigh 195 just because I've never weighed that. Well, I did once. And so, um, and once on after this diet, I was 195 and gained, whatever it is, 17 pounds. You almost gained weight. So anyway, I went out into the studio where he was doing, and I took a pizza box and something else and something else, and I made bases. And I made a home plate. And I took off running around and they said go and I took off running around and Phil just stood there and watched me and then I stopped and I went Phil just do what I'm doing say what I'm doing so I ran the pizza box and he was going look at that boy run he's round so and then I had we didn't have I didn't have to do that anymore but I did I went I ran the bases and went all the way home even though he when I was home he didn't say home he just did the first one and then he went okay and then he nailed it so it was quite funny. And between Phil and Todd, it was a comedy routine. And I've done comedy routines based on that.
um, the album would not fit on vinyl. So we had to speed it up. And we sped it up in increments. So Bad Out of Hell wasn't so sped up. But when we got to 203 Ain't Bad, it was very sped up. And then when it was played on the radio, because it got played a lot later on in March and April and May and June, it got played a lot. And radio stations, and I know you know this, used to speed records up. So here we already have a sped up record to get it on vinyl. And then the radio stations are speeding up even more. So it's, baby, we can talk all night, but that ain't getting us nowhere. I was Alvin and the Chipmunks. And we'd come on the radio, and artists usually want to hear themselves on the radio. I had to turn it off. It was freaking me out. Anyway, it was a hit. But uh, the guy back in the day, um, how Billboard got their numbers and how you got chart positions was a guy from the record company would go to Billboard and tell them how many records you sold the last week. Well, the guy that was delivering the final numbers to Billboard every week hated the record, hated Bat Out of Hell. So Bat Out of Hell in July and the first week, maybe two in August, should have been number one in the country for five or six weeks. It didn't, it only was 11th. He wouldn't even, we found this out, he wouldn't go in there and ask, how much did the number 10 record sell? And they'd tell him, he goes, oh man, he's just behind that. So every week we were 11. We were 11 for eight weeks. So we would have been in the top 10. And, and two out of three ain't bad, what, nine? But it should have been number one as well. And on bat two, when finally nobody was reporting except for the people that were selling records, and sound scan, now it's legitimate. Bat Out of Hell 2 is number one. Anything for Love is number one. Rock and Roll Dreams is number eight. So that's what would have happened on Bat Out of Hell had it been real. So anyway, but Bat Out of Hell is what? I don't know. Either the fifth, the fourth, the third, or tied for the second with ACDC. I have no clue. But somewhere in the top five, of all-time records sold. Michael Jackson is number one, and then it's ACDC, me, and, we're, and then it's the Eagles' greatest hits, and then after that, I, I, I can't, I'm trying to remember, oh, uh, BG, Saturday Night Fever, I believe, is in there, but it flips out every once in a while, you, you, you've got another artist that flips in there, but the constants are the Eagles, Meat Loaf, ACDC, and Michael Jackson. So anyway, I thank you for helping us reach whatever that is, because you see, uh, some artists going around with their chest puffed out and thinking, oh, I'm better than, I'm not. I don't think I'm better than anyone. I think I'm right with you, right with you. Oh, man, after you ask me how I got meatloaf, you're going to ask me what that is? That's the two most common questions I'm asked. Okay, so anyway, if you go and get the lyrics, there's about eight different phrases. I'll never stop dreaming of you every night of my life. I'll never do it better than I do it with you. Uh, uh, let's see. I know, I see. I wouldn't do anything for love. I'd run right into hell and back. I would do anything for... Oh, I'll never lie to you, and that's a fact. I'll never stop dreaming of you every night of my life. That's it before the... That's the last one before the girl comes in. I'll never do it better than I do it with you. I'll never forget the way you feel right now. And there's one, two, three more. And, uh, but those are the lines... And the problem was this. He goes, I'll never stop dreaming of you ever night of my life. No way I would do anything for love. I'm gonna change keys. I would do anything for love. I would do anything for love. But I won't do that. Now, you forgot what I sang already, didn't you? Yeah, that's what happened.
What did I sing? I forgot what I sang because it goes, I'll never forget the way you feel. I'll never stop dreaming of you every night of my life. I will do anything for love. I will do anything for love. I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. No, I won't do that. Time you get to the second, I won't do that. You're going, what is that? So I understand. So now you know. It's the line before every chorus. There is no secret, hidden, sexual meaning. It's things like, I'll never forget the way you feel right now. I'll never stop dreaming of you. What was the first one I sang a while ago? I'm running to hell and back. I would do anything for love. I'll never lie to you, and that's a fact. No way. That's the rest of that line. I didn't sleep at all last night. That's another song, but it's not mine. So I'm raspy. I'm tired. I didn't sleep. My voice sucks at the moment. But I was trying. I gave it my all for you because that's what I do. I go on stage and I give everything I have to give. I have nothing left when I walk off that stage. I promise you. And you can ask all my band and anybody that's worked for me. I walk off that stage, I hit a wall. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of me before taking oxygen because I'm asthmatic. Now I, they gave me pills so I don't need all that. But I still just walk off stage and just fall down because and then I lay there for like six minutes and then I get up and go on. But it's like running into a brick wall when the show's over. I run right off stage and it's like running full speed into a brick wall because every ounce of energy I have goes into that show because those people at that show are the most important thing in the world to me because I owe them because they came to see me and I owe them. I love you guys. And remember, two words, keep rocking.